Our next speaker is a nationally renowned taiko player. But I knew him when he was growing up here in Bakersfield, California. See, most of the best taiko players in the world, they grew up playing taiko in Japan. Christopher Bergstrom grew up playing around with a Commodore Amiga with me. It's not the best way to learn taiko, but the good thing is, for him and for us, that Chris learns like a pit bull locks its jaws. It's amazing. He's going to share some of the strategies that he has come up with for learning new skills and for practicing. You're going to enjoy this. Please welcome Christopher Bergstrom. I saw Tycho for the first time uh, during orienta orientation week in college. If I remember correctly, there were dance groups and there were acapella groups, and I liked everything. I liked the Tycho group as well. My first friend in college was John Bailey. He was sitting next to me, and John is a drum set player. So it was after the Tycho concert in particular, the Tycho performance in particular, that John turned to me and said, we should try that. I tried it, and it turned out I loved it. The first song I learned is a piece called Renshu, which means taiko, in, uh, excuse me, which means practice in Japanese. It was written by a man named Seichi Tanaka from San Francisco Taiko Dojo. Let me play just a little sample of that piece, Renshu. My first realization in the study of Taiko is how difficult it is to do simple movements. That piece, Renshu, only has two dynamic levels, really loud and soft. But in transitioning from loud to soft, going from strong hits where your hands are coming up high to the quiet hits where you have to stay down near the drum, you have to anticipate those dynamic changes. Turns out there's four options. My right hand can go from loud to loud, it can go from loud to soft, it can go from soft to soft, or it can go from soft to loud. My left hand can do the same. Both hands can do that simultaneously in every possible combination, and every combination needs practice before you can do it well. Well, for the first few years of playing taiko, I didn't know this. And when my hands wouldn't do what I expected them to, at least subconsciously, I would be frustrated or disappointed. And it took me a long time to realize that every one of those combinations is different. Now, mid-career, as a professional player, I still have these glitches in my playing. In a big concert in the middle of a solo, sometimes my hands will freak out. I spend every day trying to get rid of these. I spend every day trying to extend my technique and become more fluent on this instrument, and yet they're still there. But now when I practice, I'm not frustrated with myself. I'm not disappointed. I try really hard not to think of this negatively. When my hands freak out, it means that in 19 years of playing taiko, in all of those thousands of rhythms that I've played, somehow this rhythm, this little thing, this hand combination, slipped through the cracks. 
It didn't get the practice that it needed. Perfect. I know exactly what to work on. What a gift to have discovered this thing. So now I think of these glitches in the most positive way I can. It's a struggle to do this. I've given it a new name. Instead of saying the glitches, I call them truffles. And I try to practice being thankful for having uncovered one of these mistakes. If I can find those things and tackle them systematically, I will become a great player. I'd like to play for you another piece. This is a sample from a new composition I'm working on. It's called Rididlepa. Basically, it's all truffles. My job now, as a taiko player, is to defend practice. Most of the responsibilities in my life outside of taiko come with due dates and meetings and people depending on me. So Brandon needs that email tomorrow. If I don't do that, he's going to have difficulty. Of course, I get that done. It's easy to get that kind of work done. Personal practice doesn't have those kind of demands. The drum waits patiently. The first step for me was to make sure that the people around me understand uh, my predicament, this difficulty of daily, lifelong practice. It's now an acceptable excuse among my friends to not go out to dinner because I need to stay home and practice. It's OK. I, my parents aren't offended when I bring an instrument along to a family vacation. My roommate went so far as to list in her demands of accepting her new job that as long as I'm employed here, Chris can practice in the basement. And if I become a great taiko player, it will be because I have defended practice. And all these people around me, we have worked to hold on to this very fragile thing called practice, to defend it from all of the trials and tribulations of daily life, to make time for me to be with that drum. 
The second biggest challenge for me is motivation. How do I, day after day, do the hard stuff? How do I get down on my hands and knees and root around for that truffle, find it, unroot it, wash it, slice it, cook it? In terms of a percentage of the total time, the reward for all that work, that, m that moment of eating this truffle pasta is brief and it's occasional. It's not enough to sustain me for a lifetime of that hard practice. I need a way that the practice itself is rewarding. Enter the practice diary. Every day since June 22nd, 2009, I keep a log of what I've done in practice. I write down the hours and I write down some notes. And if I didn't do anything, I write down why I didn't do anything. That moment of writing in the hours column 0 0.8 or 2.5, yes, or today it's going to be 0 0.15, that moment is a recognition of my hard work. It's amazing how powerful that is for me. That list of now, I think it's 1946 or so, entries in that diary, that means a lot. I am so proud of that. I'm the only person that would look at these numbers and see anything. But to me, now, just between me and that drum, those numbers mean everything. <laughs> Since I read about the 10,000 hours rule, have you heard this rule that to be great at anything, you have to do something for 10,000 hours? It's a perfectly plausible rule. The problem is I'm skeptical of this rule because it doesn't say anything about what is good practice or what it is to be a great master. And those are critical questions. But even with my skepticism, I track my hourly practice and my progress toward that goal. Did I? I track that on a graph. I didn't bring it with me. But I have a graph that shows a little red line squiggling its way from the 22nd of June 2009, and if I stay on my current track until about 2026, <laughs> when I will reach 10,000 hours. And despite my doubts about this whole 10,000 hours thing and how do you define those things, despite all that, I really, really want that little red line to go up. So this kind of system, whatever it is, it can be silly. It doesn't need to be true. It doesn't need to be anything special. But this recognition that I give myself for practice has meant everything to me as a taiko player. Before I go, I'd like to play one last piece for you. This is in the naname style, or the slant style of taiko. For the last four or five years, I've been really fascinated with choreography. In a lot of ways, it's a return to my first experience seeing taiko and being fascinated by the way it can be half music and half dance. Uh, thank you to Brandon, thank you to Heather, thank you to Tom, thank you to everyone here at Kern Talks and to all of you for being here today. This is Jack Bazaar.